When we think of entheogens, we normally think of substances uh, that are essentially psychedelic substances, but the word entheogen means uh, to, to bring about a sense of, of the divine. So any substance that can facilitate some kind of religious experience is entheogenic by definition. Um, so I wanted to have a look uh, at uh, different cultural contexts for using stimulants in a religious way. Uh, to start with, uh, the word stimulant uh, is uh, derived from the Latin stimulare, which means to goad on. Uh, and this is a, a picture of an ox goad. So a stimulant is literally something that, that goads an individual on. So uh, in some ways it seems uh, very different to something uh, that might help restrain or control a person uh, for, for a religious quest, something that yokes them. Uh, the word yoke derives from the Sanskrit yuk, uh, which means... Um, something that controls or yokes, and the word yoga is derived from yuk as well. So you might think that a stimulant or a goad is the opposite of something that restrains or yokes, but of course both can be used together in order to perform different activities. Both the yoke and the ox goad have their uses. And while stimulation and restraint may seem to be opposites, they're opposites in the spectrum and there are experiences beyond that spectrum. Um, so, Roland Fisher developed a, a, a model of consciousness uh, where he mapped things onto, onto a, a spectrum uh, depending on whether the, uh, the energy expanding uh, part of the nervous system was being activated or the energy conserving part of the nervous system was being activated. And so he, he plotted different states of consciousness onto this spectrum from the, the normal sense of the self to a transcendent sense of the self. And it could be reached either through extreme activation or stimulation of, of, the, of the self, of the organism, um, or through, uh, through um, techniques like meditation. So there's a, a relationship that if you, if, you go, if you push the system in either of these directions, the ability of, of, uh, of, of the brain to process uh, it's uh, the, the, the life experience. Um, it goes beyond its normal capacities, and a um, a, and an unusual state of consciousness results. Now, many of these stimulant plants have legends associated with them that are, are religious in, in their nature. Uh, many of the origin stories are religious origin stories. Uh, this is a plantation of uh, Camellia sinensis, the plant from which tea is derived. The tradition is that Bodhidharma, the farmer of the Chan school of Buddhism, uh, was meditating and became frustrated because he was constantly falling asleep during meditation. So uh, the legend is that he cut off his own eyelids and threw them to the ground so that he wouldn't fall asleep during meditation. His eyelids turned into leaves and from those leaves the tea plant grew. Uh, this is a uh, Bodhidharma action figure and it's very expensive for an action figure and it does not have removable eyelids. <laughs> Many substances that are quite psychedelic are also stimulants in lower dosage ranges. The uh, Tabernanthra boga, uh, the source of ibogaine, is uh, used uh, in high doses for initiation in the Bhriti religion and in low doses to increase ritual output in ceremonies. And the plant alan, our cornea floribunda, uh, is also used as a stimulant uh, within the Bhriti religion. So there are many plants that are used as stimulants to increase the amount of ritual work that can be done, as well as to facilitate contact with uh, the spiritual world. Coffee was initially used in a sacred setting by Sufis long before it became an everyday uh, item of consumption. So before it became uh, something that we just take in the morning, those of us who, who use it, it was used in, in uh, a ritual way uh, to, to uh, create an altered state of consciousness. Uh, Cartha edulis, the cut plant, uh, is used uh, very widely in, uh, in Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia and Yemen. Um, and uh, it, it is used in a wide, wide range of different uh, uh, settings, many of them pious settings, many of them religious settings. 
The CART plan contains cathinones, which are, have similar properties to ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. Um, these ephedrine compounds are present in, uh, in these ephedra plants, um, which have been gathered here uh, by Parsi children for uh, preparation of um, the sacramental substance HOM for the HOM yasna in Zoroastrianism. Uh, so here we have a, a sacramental material uh, prepared from a stimulating plant. The, um, the HOM drink uh, is, uh, the word HOM is etymologically related to the, um, to the Vedic word um, soma. And uh, some Indologists believe that the soma medicine um, of the Vedas is also derived originally from ephedra plants. So there are different theories. Uh, but in any case, if it was derived from ephedra, uh, it would explain the enthusiasm that the god Indra felt whenever he consumed the soma drink. Stimulants are often uh, favoured by deities as foods. Uh, throughout a lot of, uh, of, of tropical Asia, the beetle palm grows, and it's often very important in, uh, in, in rituals of hospitality and exchange, and importantly in the giving away of brides and in marriage ceremonies. So there's a beetle nut here with a coin and a conch shell and a flower in, in the giving away of a bride. Now, importantly in this, there's a sacramental, uh, a sacrificial aspect to the, to the beetle. It is offered to the groom who, in this instance, can represent karma, the god of love. So the god of love, uh, ephedra is a preferred food, uh, sorry, a beetle is a preferred food. Um, often spirits uh, like stimulants. Here in, uh, in a Peruvian mine, uh, coca leaves are being offered to the demon of the mine to ensure the safety of the workers. And here, coca leaves are being offered to uh, the spirits of a sacred mountain. In tropical West Africa, kola nuts have, a, have a important Eucharistic functions. Amongst them, they're the preferred food of uh, the god of a very important divination system. The coca leaves in the Andes are also used in, in two different divination systems, one of which involves consumption, the other the uh, casting of the leaves and observing the patterns that they form. Here, a coca divination is being performed at an Andean wedding to determine the, uh, the, the future prospects of the bride and groom. And of course, tea leaves are also read as a, as a form of, uh, of, uh, of divination, uh, tassiography. This is probably an innovation on coffee ground reading, um, which is probably the older tradition. Now, um, there are obviously some drawbacks to the use of stimulants in a religious context. Uh, there are a number of problems with stimulants. Uh, there are behavioural, psychological and physical consequences of excessive use of many stimulants. Uh, and um, quite apart from, apart from the medical and psychological aspects of stimulant use, uh, there is also a, 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 a big problem, which is that they're reinforcing, they're habit forming. The, the craving for them can be very strong. So this, uh, this represents a... a, a a great problem um, or a great challenge because there's a potential for spiritual growth from giving these materials up as well as from exploring them and certainly using them, uh, using them uh, wisely or in a balanced way create, uh, it requires a lot of discipline and a lot of insight. Um, now although there are obviously a lot of problems with them, there are also a lot of, of traditions uh, that, um, that are worthy of respect uh, and of value in people's lives. So there's not saying that knowledge is like a Boab tree, that no one person can embrace knowledge. It has to be um, a collaborative effort and it has to be approached from different sides. So I'm trying to, to look at different sides of stimulant use. It tends to be seen uh, as a synthetic panic, a modern problem. And there have been a lot of synthetic materials that are very powerful that have come out of laboratories. Um, and there are quite a lot of different structures. There are uh, pyrovalerones and uh, benzylpiprazine, uh, some of the tryptamines like alpha-methyltryptamine, um, and of course the uh, caffeinones and, and uh, amphetamine. So quite a lot of different materials uh, have stimulant properties uh, that are quite reinforcing, uh, quite addictive, potentially. Uh, depending on the context around it, of course, there are cultural, cultural aspects that are very important. 
But uh, the, the origins of our relationship with stimulants are, are very archaic. They're not simply something from the laboratory. Uh, the San uh, of Southern Africa have been using hoodia for, for a great length of time as an aid to the hunt. Um, this is a plant the, that uh, the principles of this plant have been uh, patented by the Pfeiffer Corporation for use as um, appetite suppressants. Um, they're also stimulating substances. Uh, is this, uh, this involvement in hunting is significant from a religious point of view because uh, hunting is often a sacred activity. The, the kill has a sacrificial aspect. Uh, the act of hunting itself produces an altered state of consciousness and focus. Uh, many hunting societies use stimulants. Um, in the Western Amazon, we have the Fala Medusa frog um, with its uh, peptides, which eventually cause uh, clarification of the senses. Uh, Tabernay Montana Sananho, uh, which uh, contains uh, stimulating materials and is used uh, in hunting, uh, and caffeine containing substances like uh, the Yoko here, um, Polinia capana. The Cree uh, of uh, southeastern North America uh, used the calamus rhizomes uh, in the hunt. Uh, and for the Cree, the calamus was known as muskrat root because they had observed that the muskrat root would eat it and become excited. This is a very common theme in, the, uh, in, in, in origin stories as well for stimulants. The aboga shrub. It, there are a number of stories about uh, how it was originally discovered. Often it's the, the porcupine or the wild boar that discovers and shows the um, mbuti how uh, iboga can be used. But, uh, but gorillas and mandrels also consume the root for stimulant purposes. The, uh, the legend of the discovery of coffee involves Kaldi, who was a 9th century goat herd. He saw that his uh, goats would dance after eating the coffee. Um, the story is probably an invention because there's no evidence of coffee use until the 13th century. Um, but nonetheless, there's this, uh, this, this idea of, uh, of, uh, of, of animals discovering the stimulants. Now, you know that Chaldi is very happy, very euphoric. There's, there's an aspect of religious experience that uh, the theorist of, uh, historian of religion, Rudolf Otto, called uh, the holy. And it had two parts, um, a, um, a, a, a kind of a fear of God aspect, a terrifying or inspiring aspect, and a sense of peace and well-being, um, uh, which he called the fascinans, the attractive aspect of religion. The stimulant drugs often produce... Uh, a state of consciousness that is very similar to this emotion, this religious emotion uh, of grace uh, and, uh, and euphoria. So it's no surprise really that they've been used in a lot of religious contexts. Chocolate, cacao, is one example of this uh, religious euphoria, sense of well-being. Uh, the Maya and the Aztec uh, considered it a, an item of prestige, a luxury good, but also uh, something that induced well-being. And similarly, coca, of course, um, is, uh, is connected in the Andes, in the uh, Chechua speaking cultures, with, uh, with pleasure and well being and an exalted state of consciousness. It um, often stimulants like caffeine also increase aesthetic appreciation, artistic appreciation. So it's no surprise that they're used in religious rituals where the focus is on um, the blending of sensory modes and aesthetic appreciation, so, such as the tea ceremonies. And also uh, to uh, induce um, a sense of communication between people. Um, uh, this is a, a, a cut ceremony from Yemen, and the cut is used um, in large part to facilitate communication between people, to, to get the flow of, of words and ideas, sharing words and ideas. Also, the Seminole Indians uh, valued uh, this plant, Lacananthes tinctoria, for its ability to produce um, eloquent speech. It's a, a lesser known uh, stimulant. Uh, a number of, of different groups in southeastern North America uh, use the caffeine containing plant, uh, a member of the holly family, Ilex vomitoria, primarily as a, um, a morning stimulant for council meetings. Uh, it was believed to have the, 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 uh, the, the stimulating effect um, was believed to purify and make people 
more honest, um, it, that, that uh, also it would induce sweating, and, and sweating was a form of purification as well. There's an unfortunate name, Ilex vomitoria, because it um, you know, suggests that it causes vomiting, which, which it doesn't uniformly. Uh, the, um, uh, a, a lot of the, the, the groups who were first seen to be using this, this brew, the black drink, um, valued purging. Uh, very highly. And it's not at all clear that the substance they were consuming to cause the purging was the stimulant, um, the black drink. There's some, some confusion there around it because a lot of people drink it without being ill at all. So it's not clear if it's a high dose or very hot or whether it's a totally different substance that caused the purging. Uh, now, um, stimulants also are very good for physical activity, for, for sacred dance. Uh, here are some beauty dancers. Uh, in West Africa, there are a lot of plants related to Tabernanthra boga that are sources of stimulating um, materials for, for, for ritual. Um, so a lot of the substances related to ibogaine, uh, voacangine and isovoacangine are, are very effective religious stimulants. Uh, so here we have uh, voacanga thuasii and voacanga africana, Tabernanthra montana elegans fruits and Tabernanthra montana crassa flowers, all of which are, are traditional stimulants. The, uh, the Tarahumara of Mexico are well known as one of the oldest traditions to use the peyote cactus, Lophophora williamsii. They're also very well known for their sacred race races, their racing games, where they kick balls, a wooden ball, over a huge territory to score goals, and it's a sacred activity. So this is a sacred sport activity uh, in which stimulating cacti are used uh, and the primary ones are Areocarpus fissuratus. There are two different forms, growth forms of Areocarpus fissuratus. Uh, Mimillaria grami, um, subspecies olivae, and Epithalantha micromeris, uh, all of which have uh, phenylethylamines that, uh, that have stimulating properties. Now, uh, the idea that, that sport is a sacred activity is... Um, an example where, where cultural categories don't quite match up between cultures always. Uh, for us, sport is generally a profane activity. Um, and I just want to talk about the categories of sacred and profane and how they can differ and the reasons for our own, the historical reasons for our own categories of sacred and profane. The ideas are essentially medieval um, and in Medieval life, the major distinction, the major binary categories of life were between the everyday, it's kind of harvest activities, and, and the church, the life of the church. People worked in fields mostly close to their homes, so the work-home divide wasn't such a big division in life. It was, it was the church and, um, and, and, and basically the rest of life, the everyday. After industrialization patterns of life changed so much, we're no longer um, working near our homes, we really only have time for um, what happens at work and everything that happens outside of work. It's not like there's one holistic integrated period. Uh, and, um, and so our categories are, are, are quite different um, for those reasons. And so uh, events where previously energies associated with the sacred have to migrate into a whole heap of other domains of life. Um, for instance, uh, festivals, different recreational activities now contain a lot of the impulses that were traditionally associated with the sacred, with the church. And so we have these hybrid categories of festivals. So people who, are, uh, who, who take speed and go to concerts um, are, are acting out... Um, some kind of oppositional or binary um, experiences outside of their everyday working lives. They're letting a whole heap of energies out in different ways. But it's a little bit difficult for us to work out how to categorise that in terms of categories like sacred and profane. Also, approaches to, this, to, to, to the sacred vary uh, with, the, with the kind of personality that the culture itself has. Um, the anthropologist Ruth Benedict argued that different cultures have different kinds of personalities and that the traits of these personalities are inculcated, uh, socialised into children as they grow up. So that children in particular cultures grow up with some of the personality of their culture. And following on from the work of, uh, of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, 
is she uh, adopted the categories of the Apollonian and the Dionysian as her, her principal cultural types. And they're very, very different cultural types. They're based on, on, um, on classical ideas, because Nietzsche was studying uh, uh, the development of, of theatre uh, in Greek life. Um, so for, for Nietzsche and for uh, Ruth Benedict following um, him, the, the main types of culture are the Apollonian, which is very, very rigid, very controlled, which exalts the, the super-ego rather than the id, and the Dionysian, which, which favours let go, surrender, uh, wild exuberance, uh, rather than restraint and control. So you have two very distinct kinds of personality in cultures. And that uh, follows through to religious traditions as well. So we have one category of religion, but we have very, very different types within that. So on the one hand, we have something like Orthodox Christianity, which is very Apollonian, very controlled. And, and it has a particular set of values. And then you have this more uh, Pentecostal, wild kind of evangelical, this Southern, Southern Baptist handling the snakes, a much more Dionysian, wild kind of, uh, of religion. Uh, obviously, stimulants are going to work better with a Dionysian type of religion and Dionysian type of culture than with a uh, Apollonian type. And we find in the Southern Baptists that there is, in fact, a stimulant used, and that is strychnine. Uh, so strychnine in, in, in fairly low doses. Now, it's not very well appreciated that strychnine in low doses is a powerful central nervous system stimulant. It uh, was widely used in sport. Here we have uh, the winner of, uh, of, a, uh, of a marathon at the Olympics early in the 20th century um, who collapsed and went into convulsions after winning his race uh, because he'd been given two successive doses of strychnine of about one milligram. And, uh, and very nearly died. It's now been banned in sport, of course. So I just want to show um, a Pentecostal service. And what I want you to watch out for is the liberal consumption of strychnine in this service. Whatever people may think, there is no denying this is high energy religion. Snakes pass from hand to hand. Elders speak in new tongues and the dancing doesn't stop. The celebration of their belief in God is compelling to watch, but for the followers there is a price to pay. Swigs of strychnine and poisonous snake bites can be deadly. Have you lost congregation members to snake bites? We lost system 62, and then we lost one last December, this past December was a year ago. Chapter 16 in the Book of Mark calls for God's followers to handle serpents and drink poisons. Some see it as the ultimate proof of their faith. For those unfamiliar, all this may be too bizarre, but at the Church of the Lord Jesus in Jolo, it has been this way for some 40 years. Like coal mining, religion here is passed on from one generation to the next. For these people, it's a way of life that's timeless. The challenge here for us is that this, this, this represents a serious challenge for harm minimization. Uh, people, people taking strychnine and handling poisonous snakes. We might see it as a little bit crazy, and it's, it's quite possible that there might be people in uh, cultural systems outside of our own that think that some of the things that we do represent some harm minimization challenges as well. So I want to put that up there. It's just a bit of a, like a, a cultural shift. Um, how are we perceived? And uh, what are the acceptable risks? Um, and, uh, and, and put stimulants in that context as well. They may not be the most perfect tools, uh, but a lot of that is culturally relevant. It's a culturally relative uh, issue. Um, nonetheless, from this, this fairly brief survey of stimulant use, we've seen that there are, are uh, some more um, moderate ways of incorporating stimulants, uh, synthesizing the Apollonian with the Dionysian and, and uh, incorporating stimulating substances into uh, um, quite formal systems uh, of, uh, of, of, of religion. So uh, from the, uh, the use of, of the black drink in council meetings, divination with coca leaves in the Andes, uh, the very formal exchange of, of cut in cut parties, and in the tea ceremony, we find ways of integrating the Apollonian values with the Dionysian sacraments. Uh, a further word on, on Dionysus, the god of, of wine and madness. In many ways, wine is, ironically, the West's stimulant. 
even though it has central nervous system depressing effects, there's a brief phase at the beginning of wine intoxication where there's a dopamine cascade and a sense of excitement and stimulation. So in some respects, this is the template of Western culture's approach to stimulants. You see here, it's a painting of the childhood of Dionysus, that's to say the early phase of intoxication. And you see there's a lot of activity and, uh, and energy and, and, uh, and buoyancy to it. Stimulant comes from stimulare and ox goad, but for the Romans there was also a goddess stimula. And this goddess was the mother of the god of wine. The Roman stimula is equivalent to the Greek semele, the mother of Dionysus. And she was an unusual goddess. She started life as a human being, but tricked the most intense aspect of divinity into revealing itself to her. And although the god did not want to reveal himself in his true form, she insisted that he keep his word, which she had uh, tricked out of him. And so he revealed himself. And in that moment, she was consumed, burst into flame, and became a goddess. And so I just want to end this discussion of the religious possibilities of stimulant use by reminding us all that stimula uh, was and is a goddess, a sacred being.